Where's the stock market headed? Up, down, or just plain sideways? Where are the best opportunities right now? Dave cuts through the fluff in a no-nonsense manner. Random Thoughts with Dave Landry Podcast. Here's your host, Dave Landry. This is your Random Thoughts Podcast for Friday, June 17, 2016. We've now come to the most difficult part of trading. You. In part three of the only three things that you ever need to become a successful trader, I'm going to discuss trading psychology. The mechanics of trading aren't that difficult. Developing the proper mindset to actually trade is. I do have some good news, in addition to saving some money on my car insurance, provided, of course, that you're willing to apply some brutally honest introspection. Around a year ago, I decided I was going to do a course on trading psychology. I thought I'd be able to crank something out in a few weeks. I quickly came to the realization that I might have slightly underestimated the task. Fast forward one month, and all I had to show for my hard work was a 14-page to-do list of what I felt must be covered. And that list continues to grow to this day. Faced with this monumental task of condensing all this into the most salient points, I approached this column like a miniskirt designer. Paraphrasing Churchill, I had to make it short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover the subject. The psychology of money, or lack of money, you really have to sing like you don't need the money. In order to make money, you often have to be willing to lose money. As I often preach, you must approach trading holistically, factoring in all three aspects. Money management, methodology, and mind. Focusing on the money management, if you're trading at a small size, then avoiding the psychological pitfalls is much easier. It'll be easier to follow the plan if a loss only monetizes to a nice meal, a round of golf, or a tank of gas. For your boat. I suppose that I'd be remiss if I failed to mention that you have to be adequately capitalized in the first place. If you need the money in your trading account to feed Junior or for the rent, then you're doomed from the start. Markets rarely move in a straight line. They back and fill. And that's a propensity we can use our advantage, by the way. If you're undercapitalized, I could all but guarantee that you're going to exit at the first signs of adversity, thereby missing great trends. And even if you do catch a trend, you're going to bail out early. This is because you'll mentally monetize the profits, realizing that the money could and should be used to pay rent or feed Junior. So what if you don't have money? That's simple. Don't trade. I make a lot more money in my educational business if I told you that you could easily turn, and I quote, $5,000 into $500,000, unquote. You can't make this shit up. Do get educated, though. Spend what money you do have on some courses that are grounded in reality, like mine. Seriously, some of my best clients chase rainbows for 10 years and then find me or come back to me. So, if you're still grail hunting, see you in 10 years. I've yet to meet anyone who truly wanted to become successful, not become successful. I'm not selling the dream, unless you're willing to realize that the dream is hard work. Trust me, if it were that easy, you'd never see my fat ass again. Instead, I'm here every day grinding it out. Even if you do have plenty of money, then make sure you allocate a portion to trading in just that. Early in my CTA days, I traded a small account as a favor for a wealthy friend. Big mistake on multiple levels, but that's a story for another day. Nearly daily, I would receive panicky phone calls. You would have thought he was destitute. The yearly maintenance on his boat alone was in far excess of his account size, yet he couldn't stomach a few hundred dollars of swings of ups and downs. Over the years, I've seen multimillionaires dabble with small accounts, blow them up, and then stress like they have become homeless, even though they still own several. They then rinse and repeat. So if you do have money, allocate enough to trading and have it for just that. The psychology of emotions and stress that comes with decisions. As I have teached and preached, with every decision comes stress and emotions. Damasio, sure. I'm craving a roast beef po' boy for lunch. Deciding whether to get one or not comes with a consequence and stress. Yeah, I'll feel pretty good while I'm eating it, and I deserve a treat. But how will I feel afterwards? Will I be productive this afternoon or opt for a nap? Notice I use the word feel. Emotions are attached, and that's just a simple lunch decision. You must reduce the amount of emotional round trips you make. Write that down. You do this by reducing the amount of decisions. You reduce the amount of decisions by planning ahead, and you plan ahead while things are static and not winging it in the heat of battle. Know what you're going to do, and then just do it. Easy, huh? It's not easy, but not nearly as hard as most people try to make it. Never forget to obsess before you get into a trade. Not afterwards. Early this week, someone pulled their stop on a stock at my trading service. Yeah, occasionally we do have a loser. 
and the stock didn't reverse. He's now faced with even more decisions. Continue to hold on and start smoking the hopium? Get out now and risk selling at the exact low and then watch the stock take off without him? Etc. I'd be willing to bet that I'll probably be watching this stupid stock all day and every day, tick by tick. The obsessing afterwards will cause him to become the proverbial deer in the headlights, thereby missing the next big winning trade. And that might be the one trade that he needs to build confidence in the methodology and himself. Trading without a plan increases the decisions and the vicious cycle continues. Again, you must reduce the amount of emotional round trips that you take. Based on the stress and emotions that each decision has attached to it, I truly believe that we have a finite amount of decisions that we're capable of making, especially in the heat of battle. This is why the burnout rate is so high in air traffic controllers and day traders. So again, you must reduce the amount of emotional round trips that you make. Trading psychology. Garbage in, garbage out. As mentioned in the other two parts of this series, it's impossible to discuss any of these three things as necessary to become successful in a vacuum. So again, sometimes your best defense is a good offense. If you're taking the best trades to begin with, then the money management and position management often falls into place. If you catch some winners, you'll know that it's okay to kick some losers out of your portfolio. You'll know that they're stinking up the joint, and as mentioned above, the stress over keeping them could hinder your next decision. Yet again, obsess before you get into a trade, not afterwards. Take the best and leave the rest. Garbage in, garbage out. And if you do have some garbage in your portfolio, take it out. The good news about trading psychology. Nine out of ten times, people who contact me with trading problems tell me exactly what they're doing wrong. Dave, I'm trading mediocre setups. Or I'm trying to make something happen in mediocre markets. I'm not honoring my stops. I'm cutting my profits short, etc. Like the doctor, doctor, it hurts when I do this joke. My solution is simple. Don't do that. Livermore once said that a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. I did an article on this. See the free reports on my website under shop now. It's free. On the 10th time when I ask and they say they don't know, a little digging quickly shed some light on the problem. I know I've told this story 999 times, but I think it's worth telling again. A client once called me disgusted with the trading service because he, quote, couldn't make any money, unquote. I went through all his trades. In addition to my trades, there were 20-something day trades. I called those out, so only my recommendations were left. Without the day trades, the portfolio was slightly profitable. I'm not bragging. We don't always make money. The point is that we were profitable during the period, and he wasn't. I called him back and told him that he was actually profitable by following the methodology. Easy for me to say. But the day trades were killing him. His reply, and I quote, I know, I know, unquote. So he knew, and you do too. Money and position management, trading psychology, and methodology are all intertwined. Again, the three aspects of trading are all intertwined. If you're trading with a small size, then trade should not stress you out monetarily. You'll be more likely to follow the plan. Following the plan means that you will stay with winners and call losers when stopped. Writing winners will help you to believe even more in the methodology. Believing more in the methodology improves your psyche. Once you feel better about what you're doing, you'll be motivated through deliberate practice to pick better and better stocks. And you might then be able to afford a course which helps you do just that. Picking better stocks means that you'll have more winners, which will further reinforce your belief in the methodology. Believing in the methodology will have you realizing that losing stocks, once stopped, must be tossed out because they are eroding precious capital, which can be used to create more capital. As you can see, it's all cyclical and reciprocal. That's huge. Get better at one, get better at all. Learn to see all three. So how did I do with my mini skirt approach to this column? Well, it's certainly long enough, and unfortunately, unless I force myself to stop adding to it while I'm proofing it, it's going to get much longer. I suppose the one blatant thing that I didn't cover is that the same things that are helping you to survive and prosper in the real world are often the same exact things that hinder your success in the trading world. As just one example, control. Your success in life has come to a great extent by controlling the situation. Yet, in markets, you often have no control. You can't control what other people will do. You can only control you. Quite frankly, we're just not made to trade. Rather than bore you, too late. With more on this, watch Thursdays, 6-16-16, Dave Landry's The Week in Charts. See my column that I'm reading now on my website for the link. To the markets. 
I've been amazed at the number of new bulls coming out of the woodwork recently as the market approached its recent highs. Yes, it's worked its way higher, but without a whole lot of vigor. When a market drifts higher, it only takes a few big down days to eradicate weeks of gains. And that's exactly what just happened. The slide over the past few days puts the indices back to where they were late March, early April. Longer term, the net-net change doesn't look so good either. The P's, S&P 500, and Quack, NASDAQ, are less than they were way back in 2014. The broad-based Rusty 2000, that's the IWM, is less than it was in late 2013. All of the indices, especially the Rusty, have overhead supply to deal with. See recent Market in a Minute videos, weekend charts, and columns for a lot more on this. A bull market means the market is making forward progress. I know, duh. But how could you be bullish if the market isn't making forward progress? I don't try to outsmart markets. What is, is. I follow. That's what a trend follower does. And again, if you follow a trend, you must have a trend to follow. Draw your arrows going back a couple years. If this is a new bull market, then shouldn't the market be trading higher than it was? Shouldn't it be able to plow through the overhead supply and make new highs? The sector actually isn't looking so hot. Those areas that did manage to make it to new highs have come right back in. Other areas that have been in longer term downtrends have turned back down. Rather than reinvent the wheel, watch the aforementioned videos for more on this. So what do we do? Big Dave, you seem bearish. Well, it's dangerous to label yourself because you end up painting yourself into a corner. I'm pretty much a go with the flow kind of guy. Like salt and pepper pushing it, as a trend follower, that's what you do. That's how I got the nickname Trend Following Moron. For now, it doesn't look so hot. Any idiot or moron could see that. But let's see what today and the next day brings. I'm not a raging bear, I'm just cautious. In fact, at the present time, we don't have any shorts in the open portfolio. When the time comes, though, we will. And judging from the current conditions, we might not have to wait too long. Right now, it's a market of stocks and not really a stock market. You can't blindly buy anything. Proper stock selection is key. I know it's cliche, but you really have to pick the best and leave the rest in this market. Sometimes, this means sitting on your hands. Something I wish someone would have told me was okay to do 20-something years ago. Remember, the hard part is not knowing what to do. The hard part is you. May the trend be with you. Dave Landry. Want to learn more about trading? Visit DaveLandry.com for free reports, articles, videos, and live webinars. Got a question on trading? Email Dave at Dave at DaveLandry.com. 